And my microphone is unmuted, which means we are back live here in the Redmond Town Center studio. I'm Ben Lauer, Developer Community Manager for Connect for Windows here at Microsoft. And here in Module 5, alongside me, we have Matthew Samari, who's a Program Manager on the Connect team. Module 5, if you're, if you're just joining us, welcome. If you've been with us for a while, thanks for sticking around. Module 5 is all about three things, really. Connect Fusion, Face, and HD Face. Yep. And these are areas that Matthew covers deeply as a program manager, and so that's why we invited him to be here. So um, again, we'll just go through quick speaker introductions here. Again, uh, Ben Lauer, if you, you're with us, you've seen this slide now a few times. Uh, this is some information about me. My role, let me just sum up this slide, all the words on the slide. My role is to help developers build amazing apps and experiences using Connect. So that spans developer events and content and support and programs. So that's what I do. Uh, Matthew, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. So I am a program manager, again, on Connect. Been with us for, for a while now. My focus is on the HD face tracking, uh, surface reconstruction, and then the camera pose tracking. Um, so those latter two play directly into the Fusion we'll be speaking about today, as well as some of the face experience. So with that, we're going to go ahead and dive on in. So three big things. Ben mentioned that we're going to be jumping into today. The first is Fusion. Uh, we're actually going to start this off with a demo because it's helpful just to understand the why Fusion exists right off the bat and see how it works. And then we'll go into some pieces on how to actually make it work for you. We'll then go into the Face APIs, which are the a little more accessible, easy to use APIs and, and interesting content. And then finally, we'll dive into HD Face, which is really for that rigorous, very interesting, in-depth things that you can go into with the face models. So that in mind, we are going to start with Connect Fusion. So the first thing we're going to do, as I mentioned, is we're going to do a demo of Fusion and then look at one of the models. So I am going to go ahead and get... So we're looking at one of the models. So our model for this is going to be none other than... Our own... Our own Carmen. Carmen. Give me one second. Carmen's coming up here to be our model. That's terrific. So I'm going to get this all set up. What we are looking at right now is our Fusion Explorer application. Um, I'm going to hit Reset Reconstruction. And you can see as I move around Carmen, we're generating a 3D model of Carmen in real time. So all this processing is actually occurring in real time, which is one of the most impressive things about Fusion. Um, you can see here on the bottom right the ability to mess with voxel parameters and size. You can capture color if you'd like to. Um, there's a bunch of different options here. We'll dive into what they each mean, but this is a good way to see how Fusion works and how it runs in real time. So thank you very much, Carmen. So just something I want to point out there, Matthew, is uh, I don't know, anybody who was looking at this with a really sharp eye, you may have seen in the bottom left there, we were running at eight frames per second. Now, Matthew said, hey, there's a lot happening here, a lot of data being captured. Fusion is very, very GPU intensive. And uh, the machines that we have in the, the studio today, they're no slouches. They're, they're, very, they're very good machines, but they don't have the most powerful GPUs. And so it's fair to say, right, that if the more GPU you throw at Fusion, the better it's going to do. Uh, yeah. And we do have sort of a minimum card that we recommend to have a full 30 FPS experience. Yes. So when Fusion ships, you'll see in the documentation... Um, suggestions for, for the number of cores and different elements of your GPU. It is very GPU intensive, but again, for the applications you're going to be using it on, you're going to want that GPU anyway. Um, and so as an example, the next thing we're going to show you is actually a mesh we created earlier this week using Fusion. Uh, we did the exact same thing we did with Carmine, and I'm opening it up in Mesh Lab so you can see the detail we get. So this is Microsoft's own Chris White, um, who also helps work on the Fusion team. And as we zoom in here, you can see this was just a quick mesh that we, we got, and you can see the level of detail. Look at is that your backpack there, or is that Chris's? It's probably mine. Yeah, it probably looks like mine. yours. Yeah, but you can, <laughs> and to that point, uh, the folds in the, uh, in the shirt, the folds in the backpack, you can see the nice flat plane in the background. Now, we scanned just the front half of him, so you can see 
how, how we are able to manipulate depth there. And if you wanted to use this for 3D printing, you could very easily slice off the back. Or if we wanted to get even more detail, we could come all the way around them and get a full 3D model. So again, this is just a great example of what you can do with Fusion. It is a, it's an interesting tech. It's very different than the other ones in the APIs, and, and we're excited for people to play with it and, and experience what it can do. So let's jump on back. So how does Fusion actually work? This is, let, let's get to the meat of it. There's two options that you have with Fusion. There's, there's the path of least and most resistance, as we call them, or differing levels of pain, depending on your capabilities and experience within 3D reconstruction. The first option is what we like to call let us do the heavy lifting. So within this option, Microsoft provides a bunch of the different capabilities and facets of Fusion for you ready-made. So the first piece of that is something called a process function. What this does is this provides the initial six degrees of freedom transform um, that is necessary to begin rendering Fusion. What six degrees of freedom means for those not familiar is, is this is the initial X, Y, Z, and roll pitch in y'all of the camera. Basically what we're saying is this is where the- Y'all, as in like, we're from the south and we're saying y'all? <laughs> Yeah, as in angle. Okay. I see where you're going there. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what I heard there. I'm a Texan, so I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I can be confused. So the purpose of having those measurements, especially the yaw, is you're able to understand this is where the camera is in three-dimensional space to begin creating that transform and understanding that reconstruction. So the second piece is the meat of it, which is actually creating the reconstruction. We have a set of functions, a just simple create reconstruction one that takes all of your parameters for you, uh, the number of voxels you want, the, the size of the volume you want to scan, uh, where the camera may be initially placed if you already know, and it just starts running, creates the reconstruction for you, and that's all you need to do. Uh, the last piece there is we have an experimental pose finder. It's another six degrees of freedom tracker. If Again, if you're experienced, you want to play with it, feel free. It's going to have a lower degree of quality. There's a, it's a little bit uh, more in its infancy, but it's, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, I, one, one thing I just want to mention here, Matthew, before we move on is that uh, if you've downloaded the public preview uh, SDK today, um, Actually, I should say, if you haven't downloaded it, go download it now. You, you really need to get this and get access to it and start playing around. If you have downloaded it and you've gone in, maybe you've spent some time looking since the start of this module and you've said, ah, where is Fusion? Fusion is actually not in the public preview that we shipped today. Um, essentially, there's more tuning and tweaking that we want to do. The, um, the IR and depth characteristics are different, moving from the V1 technology to V2, so we feel like there's more work we can do to make that better and really tune it. So it's not there today. However, if you're really crazy about Fusion and you want to get going right now, come to the public forum. Um, again, the, we'll share the link later. Come to the forum, tell us you want access to it, and we have a way to get you into some uh, private builds where you can get access to, to Connect Fusion. So again, not in the public beta or public preview, but we can get it to you if you let us know in the forum. Yep, absolutely. Fusion, the V2 sensor is a lot more powerful and gets a lot more depth information than anything we had in V1. Um, so paradoxically, that gives us a lot more information we have to work out through the 3D reconstruction, and there's a few pieces we just want to refine before getting that out there for everyone. So. Second fusion option, this is the path of most resistance and probably the most painful, but again, gives you the most flexibility if you're someone that really wants to be able to edit and mess with the different elements in the pipeline as you go to get a reconstruction that's most fitting of your needs. So the first thing you're gonna do, and again, this is gonna be fairly deeply technical, so if this is not something you're interested in, feel free if some of these things may go a little over the head, but for those experienced, it'll be good to know. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna have a raw depth map that you're gonna be able to pull in and it will give you your initial world of camera transform. It will also give you your known world position and it will start the integration of each of the depth map at each voxel. So basically what we're saying is, here is the initial view of our world that we're seeing in depth and let's start assigning values to it so we can start making a reconstruction. After that, We'll start acquiring more and more frames. We'll align those using an iterative closest point algorithm uh, to the previous mesh that we've started creating. And then we will integrate those in. So you can think of this as your data collection phase. We are, we are seeing new 
entries into depth. We are aligning them to what we saw previously to be able to get this reconstruction going in real time. And then we are integrating those changes in so we can keep it moving. So this is, again, data collection, sort of your first big step in the fusion algorithm. Before we move on, I just want to ask, this is a live event. Sure. We've actually been fixing typos in the slides as we go. Is it closes point or closest point? It is closest. Closest point. Yes. So if you could maybe even just quickly escape that. I'm, I'm really sure. putting you on the spot here, I know. But I just want to make sure that we get these slides perfect um, before we, we finish up the event here. You are good. There we go. Terrific. All righty. Like so, so the next stage, we've got our data. We have raw depth values. So then we're going to go into a voxel representation. So I'm going to speak more on voxels on the next slide, what those mean, what they are. Um, but basically, a voxel is a unit that allows a, that is stored a depth value. So this is going to be either positive or negative. We'll explain why in just the next slide. But this is sort of our, our more process representation of what the depth and the different elements within the scene are. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and create a mesh. So this is a mesh consistent with any of the other animation meshes you'll see through a variety of game and animating pipelines. It provides standard outputs like the number of triangles, color, um, all sorts of different things. So, so thinking about, th this is a really nice uh, diagram. So thinking about this, I just want to make sure that I'm kind of um, thinking about how this relates back to what we saw you do with Carmen when you did the scan. Yep. Is it fair to say then when you were scanning him, we're in sort of this integration phase, as you're moving it around and the sensor's acquiring all this data, things are being aligned and it's this iterative scanning integration alignment thing happening. And then at some point we say, hey, we're good. Those voxels that now represent the scan can then be output to the mesh, is that? Yep, and so act and actually within the, the application we showed itself, it actually goes an additional step where we're doing the integration, we're doing the alignment, and what's being visualized on the screen was actually the voxel representation. Okay. So if you see in the bottom of the app, there's a little button to create mesh that gets you to our step four, um, but but you are seeing the voxels in real time. So that's exactly as you described. Inter aligning, integrating, aligning, integrating, outputting the voxels on the screen in real time, which again is the really unique part of this this technology. And then you hit one button and you have a mesh you can use. Okay, cool. Thank you. So voxels, just to get everyone up to speed. Um, so a voxel is very literally a volume pixel. Um, so this is a, a volume pixel in 3D space that can store information uh, really relative to whatever you'd like in it. For us, we store distance to the closest surface. So a voxel will be positively or negatively signed depending on its distance to a closest surface. And you can see on this diagram here, for example, if you have at the intersection of positive and negative voxels, you will in fact have a surface. So again, for those going with option two that want to do a really custom reconstruction, um, when you're going and trying to create your mesh, this is something to keep in mind. You'll see, you'll see values between negative one and positive one for each of the voxels and be able to figure out your mesh from those. So I'm th thinking back to uh, you know, when I was in uh, some of my early math classes, algebra or whatever it was, where you start thinking about graphing things, you learn about x, y coordinates, you learn about z, or you think about a computer screen, and we know that this screen here is a series of pixels in both x and y planes. How do I now think about voxels in that? It's, it's adding Z, but then each of these little cubes has its own volume in this sort of 3D coordinate system, or how do we think about that? Yeah, I would think of it in the sense of you took your screen and then you just stretched it out over 3D space, and you're just layering all these cubes in front of each other, in front of each other, in front of each other, except the difference is rather than just having an X and Y, you now have a Z value that incorporates depth. Okay. So, so it is very literally... This whole space, for example, if we were going to scan this in Fusion, you define a volume, you define those X, Y, and Z, and then within that entire space, you're able to say, here is voxel X sub 1, Y sub 1, Z sub 1, and that specific voxel has a value, even if it is just in open air as it right. is right now. Could you bring up the um, Fusion Explorer demo app again for a second? Absolutely. Give me one uh, moment. Because you mentioned this during the demo, but I don't think we, I don't think we went into it in enough detail. There are those slider bars there at the bottom sort of right area of the UI. And those slider bars are representing the ability to tune how much data is being 
I should say, how many voxels are essentially being packed into the available volume? Yeah, absolutely. So can we get that back up on screen just for a second? I, I want Matthew to just kind of talk to these for a second. Sure. And so one caveat I'll give as we look at this is the mesh is going to be deformed because I'm a moving object and it thinks I'm stationary. So you can, you can see it will degrade over time um, because I'm actually moving. But to Ben's point, if you look at these bars on the bottom right, uh, you can adjust the weight of each voxels. This we, we recommend being around 150. It's but the just... integration weight is how much weight we give to what the camera has already seen versus new information. Correct. So you'll see here if you, if you put this to one extreme, as Matthew moves around, you'll actually see the model catch up really quickly. And then and the other extreme would be if you moved, the model that's on screen would actually kind of catch up very, very slowly, exactly. depending on how you set that integration weight. Exactly. And so other things to keep in mind here, we can do voxels per meter. So for example, if you want to get really high grain detail, you can see how I just became a lot more granular. Uh, the thing to keep in mind with this and, and what you'll notice is that the actual volume being scanned shrunk. And that's because there's only a limited number of voxels that we are looking for in a given space at a time. I believe it is 640 cubed, but I, I can double check and follow up on that. Uh, the point being is if you want to scan a, a can of soda, for example, and you want to get really, really high grain detail, then you want to increase your voxels pretty high. You can limit the volume you're scanning in, and then all of those voxels that Fusion is capable of scanning are all being done in that very limited space. And because of that, you're given a lot of detail. Actually, you, you just reminded me, we forgot. Actually, Carmen, could you bring one of those cans up here, please? I wanted to point, you said can of, of soda, and I was totally gonna show this earlier, that we love Fusion so much here at Microsoft. We actually have, um, our friends over at Talking Rain have an energy drink. And uh, I wanna make sure everybody can see this. And it's called Fusion. It's quite delicious. Um, but I just love the fact that it's called Fusion, and it's really fun that we have this thing called Connect Fusion. So I'm going to leave that out here for, <laughs> just for fun. And funny enough, that it's actually a great test case we use a lot of time with Fusion because it's a highly reflective material. It's, it's <laughs> it, a, it wreaks havoc on the it, IR. It, it, it is a big challenge, <laughs> so it is both a friend and a foe. So it's, it's good. Well, and then, and then you have the, uh, the energy boost that <laughs> will help you stay up all night while you debug the, the exactly. code. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that... That covers us for Fusion. Again, it is a very advanced, very unique technology. Uh, we will encourage you guys to use it when we get it out there in the preview. Again, it may be a little bit more time as we finish out some of the last kinks, but it is uh, very futuristic. We're excited to see how you use it, and please feel free to give us feedback as you do. One last thing I'll say about Fusion, as Matthew says, it is advanced depending on how you want to use it. If you want to just use the sample app that he demoed to scan yourself, scan your dog, scan your kid, whatever it's going to be, uh, and output that to a, to a MakerBot, 3D printer or whatever, it's totally doable and it's a ton of fun. I've, I've uh, been scanned and outputted to a 3D printer multiple times and it's fun to have all these little mini-me figurines. Um, so Absolutely. it's definitely a fun little replicator, if you will. All righty, so we are going to jump right ahead into FACE. So FACE, uh, before diving into this, the way to think about FACE and HD FACE, because they're, they're, they're separate items, we're covering them separately. Uh, FACE is the representation of a face in two dimensions. So this is purely an XY. So this gives you a lot of very simple, easy to use functions, very simple APIs that give you a lot of rich information about the face but it's very strictly 2D. When we go talk about HD face in a couple minutes here, that is a three-dimensional representation of the face. It's, it's more analogous to fusion, which we just saw being able to see things in X, Y, and Z. So just an FYI as we dive in, we're about to go into regular face APIs, and this is the 2D representations. So what do the face APIs offer us? Uh, there's, there's kind of four big facets that we're going to get ready to go over here. Uh, detection, alignment, orientations, and expressions. So detection is very, very literally, do we detect a face within the field of view of the sensor? So what this will do is it outputs a bounding box around the face or the number of faces that we happen to see in the field of view. And this can be visualized in color or infrared. The reason we wrote it as can be visualized in color and infrared, and this, this speaks to our, our subnote at the bottom, 
is the detection actually occurs purely within the IR streams of the tech. Um, but we actually used our coordinate mapper, the same thing that's available to all of you as developers, to map it back to color, and you'll see this in our sample apps, et cetera, uh, to visualize it both ways. So again, just goes to show the, the strength of the coordinate mapper as well as the, the other opportunities as well. So I know we're talking about face detection here, but looking at this photo makes me wonder, have we thought about or has there been any requests to have a rock hand detection, <laughs> like the developer here showing in the photo? Because so, we have, you know, we have open hand, we have grip, and we have the lasso, but what about the rock hand? So you put in a good plug-in for, I think, a future module, which is on creating custom gestures. <laughs> uh, so that actually is entirely possible. I'm not sure detecting two fingers would be really hard, but it would... Uh, it would be a lot of fun, though. If you want to give it an attempt to go train a model on it, we give you the tools to do so. That's right. So, That's right. So feel free. All right. So that gives us detection. The next one is alignment and actually speaks directly to the photo I have on the screen. This is a warning to all of my developers. If I ask you to send me a photo of one of our samples, be prepared for it to be shown to thousands of people online. <laughs> so what this photo is, is this actually shows the face alignment technology. So what face alignment does is it gives us access to five unique facial landmarks on the face. So these are both eyes. We look for the center of the eye, the tip of the nose, and then the corners of the mouth. Uh, the benefit of face alignment, and this is actually the sample we're going to go on to show here in a few minutes, is this gives you a lot of capabilities for simple, fun apps. Uh, we want to see how a pair of glasses looks on someone, so we're able to identify the eyes to overlay those images uh, to a lot of different, more robust texts um, uh, throughout a pipeline. If you want to consider building your own identity engine, if you want to do all sorts of different things, these are great inputs into that and really, really rich information to, to go off of. So uh, I know you uh, were, were just talking, to, you mentioned this as like two-dimensional, but I'm wondering, and I don't know if anybody on just is wondering this, but could I use those alignment landmarks and sort of project those out as vectors to then know um, the direction at which a person is looking? Like, cause if, if I look at the eyes and how those change, could I know where someone's looking using this? So we can, that actually ties us into the next section, which is head orientation. So what we do provide is a way to know where the head is oriented in a given space. And because of that, we're able to orient those facial landmarks as well. Okay. Um, there is not a way to independently orient those, those five points independent of the head orientation. So if I was over here, but looking that way, I want to be able to identify an eye vector over there and then a head vector going this okay. way. It's all, it's all kept. So would you want to use the orientation APIs that are there yes. to know where someone was looking? And, and that's, that's largely what you're going to want anyway. Because right. even, even in that example specifically, when you're, when you're thinking about eyes, because I know there's, there's a lot of interest in that field, when you look at a lot of modern applications today that are doing, quote, eye tracking, what they're actually doing is head orientation. Um, they're looking at where it, whether your head is looking at a screen or looking away from a screen or, or all of those pieces. So head orientation is a very rich input that actually covers more ground than people may consider. Okay. So diving into that, what is head orientation? So head orientation provides a quaternion or, or a four-dimensional vector of where the head is oriented respective to the sensor. Um, so, so this is important because if I am looking forward as I am right now and I have a sensor off to my left, orientation will return the value of how I am looking compared to the sensor, not necessarily how I'm looking compared to the screen. So you want, if, if orientation to whatever monitor or projection device is very important, placement of the sensor and calibrating to that will be a key element here. The other piece with orientation and the reason we use orientation is simply to prevent gimbal lock. Uh, people familiar with linear algebra or this field or that are going to want to use orientation will know what this means, but it's basically um, the reason we don't use an X in vector 3 is there's ways for two of the axes to become parallel at the same time. That locks the orientation and causes some confusion in the algorithm. Very common problem. Quaternion allows us to avoid that. that this, this bullet point here actually makes me think of my college wrestling days. And uh, if somebody was coming in to like put you in a gimbal lock, you would just throw the quaternion at them and that would prevent that. So uh, little known fact, I can't even keep a straight face on that one. <laughs> we are a lively group over here at Microsoft. <laughs> we think of good jokes. <laughs> 
when you do this all day, you you think of good puns to to help. Hey, help we're having fun. Time. Hopefully, you guys out there watching this live or on the recording later, hopefully you're having fun too and learning a lot here. So, moving on from wrestling, we're going to dive into <laughs> how you would respond to it. So, expressions. So these are unique classifiers that give you a simple binary yes, no for are you happy? Um, is your left eye open? Is your right eye open? Are you engaged? Is your mouth open or is your mouth moving? All these are pretty self-explanatory. The only one there may be some confusion on is, is engaged. Um, what this means is simply are you looking at the sensor? All right, so I believe with that it is time to get into another demo. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this demo up, open it up here, face basics. So are these samples all in the, uh, the, the preview? They should be. Okay. They should be. So I'm going to take my glasses off. This works with or without glasses, but just to make it a little easier. So what you guys are seeing here is actually those five points Could that you, I talked about. Is there a way to uh, uh, bring up the picture in picture, please, so we can see? See the room? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So what you're seeing here is the actual five points on my face as well as the bounding box. So you, so you have the corners of the mouth, the nose, the center of the eyes, and then the bounding box that covers the area around the face. So I can move off. It will track me. If, if we were to have another person come and walk into the frame, it would catch on to them very, very quickly as well. Um, so it's the basics of the face. It's very simple, easy to use. Again, the 2D representation, but that gives you a good view on what it can do. Now, why is that? So the, the screenshot that you showed earlier of one of the devs doing his, you know, best rock face, the, the, the dots on the, the regions were like a turquoise color. Sure. Um, is that just a different visualization? or? How? It's a different visualization as well as with this sample in particular. Uh, if we had another person come in the scene, you would see their face come up in a different color. It just helps us differentiate. I see. Okay. So it's a very simple, easy way to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and X out of this. And with that, we can get ready to dive into HD face. HD face was my first feature at Microsoft, so it's close to the heart. And this is uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting advanced technology that we can dive into. So again, HD face. HD face is a three-dimensional representation of the face that allows you to do two things. The first is we can capture your face in the sense of this is, this is create a 3D representation of what you look like. The second piece of this is after we have that representation, um, or before we have that representation even, we can track that face in real time and understand all of the different rich movements going on in the face and, and allow that to be retargeted to any type of rig, um, animation, or the like to be able to be used. So I'm going to dive into how does HD Face actually work. So the first part of HD Face is what is called the Face Model Builder. So it's a, it's a Face Model Builder in and of itself is, a, is one of a lot of classes that implement this interaction. It's a different API than I would say pretty much any other API in the K4W stack because it's very interactive. What I mean by that is it provides interesting knowledge around what frames you still need to capture to get the capture of the face, um, how well or how good of quality you have of the frames you already have captured. So where that gets interesting is we need 16 frames to fully capture your face, four that are left, four that are right, four straight forward, and four that are up. So as we're going through the collection process, we can tell you and then through you, the user, um, hey, we didn't really get a good view of the right side of your face. Can you look back there again? Whatever it may be uh, to ensure you get that really rich face capture you're after. Second phase in the process is actually creating the face model. So the face model is a collection of 94 unique shape units. So these are, these are again, you can think of them as vectors on the face. Um, it provides scale. It also provides hair color and skin color. Uh, the interesting thing about the adjustments is they're actually the way the face is created in itself is they're set against something we call the mean face or or the average face. Average and mean being synonymous in this sense. Oh, so not mean like, like man, I'm really a mean person. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not mean mugging. We're just <laughs> average average face. So the 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 point with the, the face model in and of itself is that we have these 94 shape units that are able to deform that mean face to get it to look specifically like you or the user you're hoping it will look like. 
And then the third phase is, is once you have that face model, um, go create a mesh with it. Um, this is the same uh, analogous process as we have diffusion, so you can create a rich face mesh that can be used in any of the very common animation applications out there today. Again, provides the set number of attributes, number of triangles, number of vertices, etc. Um, and then the footnote we threw in here at the bottom, and we're, we're going to show this actually in an example from one of our first-party studios that did this really well. Um, user experience is non-trivial in this process. So, so if, if you're hoping to use this, for example, in a consumer-grade application, which we'd be excited for you to do and help you to answer questions on as you go through it, um, you're asking the user to move their face in very particular ways to capture these capture these images. If they have glasses on, for example, you're asking them to take their glasses off. Um, so there's a lot of pieces here that are really, really important to get right, and there's some UR that has to go into that. By UR, I mean user research. Um, so it's non-trivial. I'm going to show you guys an example of someone that did it really, really well, um, and that way I can give you some ideas as to how you can approach it yourself. If you're going to do sound, you might make, make sure that machine's not muted. Okay. I, if, I think we muted it earlier. I will double check. I'm actually... I'm actually going to leave it muted um, just for the sake of good sound quality all the way through. Let me pull this up. So if we can jump over to the live video feed right here, what you're seeing is, so this is Kinect Sports Rivals. So if anyone has played this game, it is a, a Kinect game uh, shipped on Xbox One that uses that technology. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is this is actually a digital representation of the mean face. So if you're wondering how what the average human face looks like, you are actually looking directly at it. So uh, it's actually not this bumpy with as many squares, but it's a representation of it. So they, I'm assuming they've just done some kind of a um, shader. They've done some sort of effect on top of that mean face to kind of get these tiles or whatever they're doing here. Yes, absolutely. Just That's just their own styling. That they yeah, do. this is just yeah. pure stylization. So what? So there's a voiceover that goes to this. Again, this speaks to the UX piece. Um, they actually hired, a, I believe, a gentleman from Doctor Who to do the voiceover. Mm -hmm. So it's got this funny character, British voice. Um, again, go try out the game if, if you have an Xbox One and want to want to give it a go. It's a lot of fun. But, but the important piece of that voiceover is it's walking the user through looking left and right. There's some visual cues as well. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this, and we can see as we go here. So this is tracking the user's face in real time. We're getting them to look right, getting them to look left, We'll then get them to go back to center to be able to get them to look up, and then get them to look again back at center. So I'm going to pause this again one more time real quick. So, so that little interaction module that you just saw with, with the green bars that would turn blue and left, right, putting them above, that whole process of figuring out just that 30 seconds took them a very long time to get right because you have issues such as, hey, I... We're asking a user to take off their glasses to scan their face. Now they can't see really well. So what color do we need to flash to let them know <laughs> that, that we got the capture we needed? It turned out that the blues and the greens were, were really successful for that. So again, UX is not trivial. It's kind of a fun process to figure out how you can get it right, and they, they did it in a gamified way, but it's, it's, it's important to consider. So we're going to continue playing here, and this is a colleague of ours we scanned. He's a... Tall, tall gentleman, bald with glasses, so I believe that is who we are going to see here. This phase right here, just so you can see, is this is actually after the mean face has been deformed, so the mesh now resembles his face. Um, so this is him doing facial tracking in real time, moving around, smiling. We'll do a live sample of this in a moment. And then this is, again, just a part of the game. Um, they created a champion, as they call him within the game. Uh, the, the athlete will be created. One th point to keep in mind is this is a unique stylization. Um, so they've stylized the face in a particular way. But you can see the results of the face capture right there. They've stylized them to make a little bit more athletic. Um, and there you go. So this, again, is a point of, of excitement for Microsoft. It's a really unique technology, and I would encourage... I would encourage you guys to have a lot of fun with it. You know, if you're if you're able to capture a face in high definition, um, 
you know, re retargeting it to other rigs, whether it's little goblin creatures or, or whatever you may be. There's a lot of fun you can have with it. The team, this is a, a massive investment Microsoft has made over the past few years to get this tech really rich, and we're, we're excited to get this in your hands to see what you guys can do with it. Awesome. So next, we're going to do it in real time. So the, the uh, one point before we dive into the samples here, I believe the face samples and the HD face samples may not be in the SDK Explorer yet for the developer preview. Um, they will be getting in there shortly. They are, they are on the point of completion. So Wait, what does that mean? It means we didn't put them in the SDK at all? The, or they're there, but they don't, they're not in the, the browser, so you have to go to the folder directly. I, I need to follow up. I don't, all the technology is there. If you guys want to go play with this, all the tech is there. They're not currently, I believe, in the SDK, but they will be within, I believe, the next week. Okay, so, so I think what we should do is if you're out there, you're watching this right now, either live or recorded, and you've downloaded the SDK and you're not finding the samples that we've shown here, come to the forum let us know. We'll make the same offer that we made earlier in the last, or, or, earlier in this module about fusion, right? If you can't wait to get your hands on face or HD face, you need these samples, let us know. We've got a process by which we can get you into getting some private builds that are happening regularly, and we can get you access to that tech. Is that fair? Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. So I, I just quickly spun up here our HD face sample, so I will get to show you guys this. I'm going to take my glasses off. You trying yeah. to be the Hulk? <laughs> green <laughs> Not face? Not trying to be the Hulk. So maybe That would be a mean face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe a little small there. I'm going to try to scoot in. Um, and we have a few other applications running on this computer, so it may be going a little slow. Um, but you can see if I open my mouth up real wide, you can see that. Uh, move my mouth from side to side. <laughs> Eyebrows. <laughs> so again, it's, and you can see me smile. If I want to do a mean face, probably can. Not the most <laughs> frightening person, but maybe when I'm green, I can be a little bit scarier. You know what I think would be cool is if the the red dots, the visualization on the face tracking earlier made me think of like that you were a clown. Yeah. So if we could put those dots on this face, we could make you into like a some kind of a clown. Absolutely. That'd be kind of fun. So as part, as part of this application, um, when we validate, we get it in your hands. You can actually do a face capture process as well. I'm not going to go ahead and do that right now. We just we walked through that with Connect Sports Rivals, but just wanted to let you guys know that it's there. Cool. So, so again, this is this tech has a special place in my heart because I've worked on it for such a long time. Um, so, so I'm obviously a big proponent of it. But again, it's something to play with. It's something to mess around with. So, so you can see with the with the face tracking, we're getting an input relative to the sensor of of around. 30 frames a second. Um, so for anyone familiar with signal processing or, or all of these pieces to make an avatar look human, for example, you need to speed that up a lot to, to if you want a magic mirror experience or have that face animating in real time with your face. If you want to do use this as a communication tool or whatever it may be. So there's really interesting predictive motion algorithms you can go try. There's a lot of different pieces here if you want to try to make it more conversational face tracking to, to, to anticipate where the user is going to make it feel better. So again, I raise this point just to say the tech is really robust. There's a lot more you can do with it with specific applications and, and definitely go try it. There's, we've done a lot of experimentation and have had a lot of fun in the process. So let's do a quick final review. So in summary, we have Fusion, right? So Fusion provides a rich, a rich mesh reconstruction of environments and objects. The, what Fusion will allow us to do, again, is just set a volume within a given space and collect a series of voxels or, or volume pixels within that space to be able to identify what those surfaces are, what the objects are, and go from there. Um, again, I want to highlight surface reconstruction here is done specifically with voxels, which is different than some of our other technologies. Face. So faces are a great entry point into face attributes. Um, allows us to do detection on a face. Do we see it? Alignment on a face, where your eyes, nose, and corners of your mouth orient the face. Where are you looking respective to the sensor? And expressions on the face. Are you happy? Is your right eye open? Um, are you looking at the camera? So. Great entry point, highly encouraged this being a good place to start if you're new to Connect for Windows and new to these APIs. 
And then finally, we have HD face. HD face provides a high definition mesh of the face. Um, so this will be a series of actually 1,347 vertices, uh, 94 shape units that can be deformed. Um, so again, reconstruction is done by deforming these shape units in comparison to fusion, which is actually done by reconstruction using voxels. So there's a difference there, which is important to highlight. Um, and then operations and outputs are all returned in 3D space, whereas face is in 2D space. So again, this is, uh, it's been a very quick a series of minutes here trying to go through all this tech, but this is really, really interesting, exciting technology um, for all of those involved that are familiar with this industry. They know that there's a lot of folks out there rapidly working in these areas because it's something of such high excitement. We really believe in these technologies and what they're capable of, and we're really excited to get them in your hands to see what you guys can do with them yourselves. Great. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for going through that. I think we still have a little bit of time uh, for questions. We have questions that have come in during the uh, session. The guys in the room here are saying yes, and they're going to get them on screen for us. Uh, first question, can you track six people at a time or just one or two? Six. So anyone we can get a tracking ID for, we can track. Now, I would encourage you not to try to do face capture on six people simultaneously. It, it is computationally expensive. We're talking HD face capture. HD face capture on six people simultaneously. It's computationally expensive. And because of, again, talking back on the UX, how unique of a process it is, it's really something you want to do one person at a time. Um, but for the face APIs, with detection, alignment, et cetera, um, it's, it's very easily something you can do. On, on six people at the same time. So there was one change I know that was tripping some folks up over V1. In V1, we had this, we called it face tracking. Um, and in V2, I think we've made a subtle change to the API where you actually have to pass in the tracking ID for the person in some way to get the, the face data to show up. Is that correct? Sure. So since, since face can occur on on multiple faces at the same time. If there's someone particularly you're interested in, you do need to pass in that body tracking ID um, to be able to associate it with a face to get that information. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, next question. Uh, are we doing face uh, and HD face? So we could, maybe you could talk to, actually, let's, why don't we just talk about all three, fusion face and HD face, happening on the GPU or the CPU? Sure, so fusion. GPU. So again, you're going to want a pretty robust machine. We'll provide information relative to how robust in the documentation, but you're going to want something powerful if you're going to want to get near 30 frames a second. Uh, with face and HD face, the majority of all of that occurs on the CPU, um, so it's all CPU operation. Oh, so even HD face is mostly on the CPU or yes. all on the CPU? Okay, yes. cool. So uh, next question, what DLLs or libraries or lib files should people look for in the SDK to use uh, face and HD face? Sure. So the namespace should be microsoft.connect.face.dll. So Microsoft Connect Face DLL. Um, these, these are what are historically called pay-for-play APIs as well, if anyone's familiar with the term, if they've worked with us on the Xbox. Um, so HD face and face are both in that namespace. They use some common databases and different things, so we, we've paired them together there, but that's where I would... So microsoft.connect.face.dll, that's where it all is. That's where it all is. Great. Uh, how well does it work with beards and glasses? And then follow-up, how do glasses affect the tracking? So glasses... Glass, it work, uh, for HD face and regular face, they both work with capture, or they both work with glasses. For face capture, I wouldn't necessarily recommend having glasses on because it's going to mess up the shape units around the eyes um, and around the bridge of the nose, and you're going to have a very bulbous forehead, if you will. Um, you would perhaps look mean. Yeah, you perhaps <laughs> have the mean face all over again. Um, so I would... We, we, obviously recommend taking them off for that process. Um, but, but for just like simple tracking and orientation, glasses can, are fine. You can put them back on. And we actually, so in, in Connect Sports Rivals as a perfect example, um, and we didn't see it with the voiceover, but after, after they got the frames for the face and the, the gentleman was doing the tracking in real time, he was actually instructed to put his glasses back on. Um, so A, he could see, and B, you can still do the tracking with your glasses on in real time. Cool. Can you add color to change the coloring of the visualization, and can we match skin pigment? 
So we do offer skin tone as part of the capture process. So if you want to capture a user's skin tone, you can do that. I believe that's outputted as a, as a enum of six values. I need to double check on that. It may be seven. Um, but, but we classify skin tone in, in But basically those. you're saying if it's six or seven, it, there's, a, there's an enum there and we're gonna match it to the closest one. We provide six RGB values um, that you can go can go match it to, and, and you're good to go from there. And then whatever visualization you want to put on top of that, whatever color, mask, whatever you want to do, it's really up to your animation teams and, and what you want to do with it from there. Cool. So you, you talked earlier, so another question's come in, and you, you talked earlier about if you look at, and especially I, I think there's a lot of apps on smartphones or tablets, and they use the front-facing camera to do eye tracking, but like you said earlier, they're not really using eye tracking. They're just doing sort of face orientation, sort of, gaze general direction detection whatever you want to call it so do we have can we do true eye tracking or um, gaze direction so gaze tracking is not is not a capability that is going to be shipping and connect for windows and again what i would encourage folks to think about and this is to the point you just made to my knowledge i don't i don't know of any commercially popular devices right now that are doing true eye gaze tracking in a real way. Um, when you look at any device that markets itself as gaze tracking, what they're largely doing is just simply head orientation. Um, so we've seen applications out there that, for example, you look away and a video pauses right. or something like that. It's very easily something you can implement on Connect for Windows because all they're doing, and I'll, it would be the same thing as you'd be able to do, is just being able to track head orientation. So when you when you really dive into the specifics of knowing where a user is specifically looking on a screen, there's not a whole lot of use cases there that can't be accomplished just by knowing whether their head is oriented to the screen or not. Yeah, and I, and I think it's right. Like Matthew said, it's not something that we're doing with our sensor or our SDK. Um, if you haven't heard of it, there's a company out there uh, call, uh, called uh, Toby, T-O-B-I-I, and they make a dedicated um, device. You can snap it onto your laptop or to a screen, and they actually have a different technology, and they do true eye tracking, and they know where you can look. I've actually played with it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. You can kind of look at the screen and, and do different things, but we're, we're not doing that, I think, yeah, is, yeah. is what you're saying. I've used Toby as well. They've got a great SDK. They yeah. good stuff. Uh, so next question, how close or far... Do you have to be to track effectively, and uh, and and what's the maximum distance? So the the maximum distance is theoretically the same as the operational envelope of the of the sensor. So I believe that's at about four meters. Well, are we talking depth, or are we talking body tracking? Because body tracking, we go from we go out to four and a half meters, but for depth, we go out to eight meters. Sure, I would I would say from a lot of experience. Being any farther than four meters away trying to do face tracking is going to be pretty difficult um, just because of the level of detail you need on the face. Um, understandably, the farther away you are from the sensor, the less pixels the sensor has on your face to be able to do that. My recommendation would be be about a meter away and be centered to the sensor. Um, that gives you a, a even distribution of color across the face for things such as as skin tone and hair color, as well as gives you a lot of pixels across that face for the sensor to be able to see and pick up on to get those really rich emotions. Okay, cool. So, uh, last question, or do we have more after this? Last question. Uh, Fusion, what does volume max integration mean? So this, this again, uh, speaks to the point you made during, during the demo. Um, with volume integration, you can tweak the, the, the weight you provide to, to the integrating depth units coming in um, in comparison to what you already have already. Um, so pulling that up to the max would weight something much more heavily um, than the new pixels coming in. Um, so oh, wait, Sorry, just to interrupt, but are, I'm a little bit confused. Do we actually have something called volume max integration? I'm wondering if, this, if the question is... Is, I know we have integration weight. That's I'm speaking to weight. You're speaking to I'm weight, speaking but to is there weight. another parameter called volume max integration? Easiest way to check is I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, why don't you pull it up real quick? We'll get it back on screen. Give me one. I just want to make sure that we we, we cover the uh, exactly what's there. Okay, samples. Here we go. Max integration weight. So yeah. That's the weight we spoke about, and I believe that's probably what this question is referring yeah. to. Yeah, 
And I can never remember, the, the, the thing is, I never remember if a low value or if it's a high value. The easiest way to do it is to literally just test it in the UI. Like I said earlier, just set it super low and see what happens as you do your scan and then set it super high. Basically what's happening is we're saying how much weight in the integration of the model do we give to frames that we've already captured so, for example, if I'm starting to scan around Matthew and I start, on a, I start on his face and I move around, how much weight do I give to those early frames as I go around? Versus, um, you know, if I give less weight, that means that if he moves at all, then the model's going to change very quickly. But if I give it higher weight to those earlier frames, it means if he moves, it's not going to affect the scan as much, and it'll, those changes will actually manifest themselves much more slowly in sort of the visualization that you would see on screen. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. So with that, I think we're out of time. Those are our last questions. Thank you so much for tuning in to Module 5 about Fusion, Face, and HD Face. Thank you, Matthew Samari, for coming and sharing your expertise. It's fun. And uh, it was a ton of fun. Again, I'm Ben Lauer. We're going to take a, a quick break. I think it'll be roughly 10-ish minutes. Uh, so please don't go too far. We want to see you back here. We're going to come up uh, in a few moments with Module 6. Rob Relier will be back here. Alongside him will be Johan Marion, and they're going to talk about Connect Studio, Gesture Builder. Connect Studio is one of my favorite features as a developer. So please come back. Stick around, we'll see you soon.